In Myrtle Beach, you always go at your own pace. Lie out on the sand, lie out by the pool, go boogie boarding, go surfing, walk the boardwalk, walk the marsh walk, golf at one of 90 golf courses, mini golf at one of 50 mini golf courses, fish off a pier, fish from a chartered boat, go shopping, get drinks, eat the freshest seafood. The list is exhaustive, but the experience isn't. You can go all out or do nothing at all. How you relax is up to you. There is so much to do and explore, whether you're traveling with friends, family, or just yourself. With 60 miles of beach, you're going to find your place. If this sounds like what you need, then this is where you belong. Realtree has always had a connection to the fishing industry and the outdoor lifestyle. In 2016, Realtree expanded on the traditional business of creating the world's most effective camouflage patterns to create a fishing brand and family of patterns designed to connect the woods to the water and strengthen the bond between the two worlds. We couldn't be more excited to be working with the industry's top brands, retailers, and anglers to continue our growth, and we hope that you will join us. Enjoy Realtree fishing patterns inshore, offshore, on the lake, or at the dock. Learn more about the extensive line Realtree fishing patterns, apparel, gear, and more at Realtree.com. Hey, do y'all like fishing for prizes? Maybe a trip to Costa Rica or a once-in-a-lifetime African safari? Well, the Grand Strand Fishing Rodeo is back. Thanks to the hard work of Visit Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Trilogy Outdoors Media, this once popular event is back and it's bigger and better than ever. This event is comprised of 12 monthly competitions that culminate in November with our annual banquet and expo, the celebration of fishing on the Grand Strand. New to this event is the freshwater division that will help include all of our anglers that live and visit the Grand Strand throughout the year. Monthly species winners will receive great prize packages from Bass Pro Shop and Surf Signs and Designs. But most importantly, they will receive an invite for them and a guest to our annual banquet and an entry in the grand prize draw. So whether you fish the rivers, a pond, the pier, the surf, or a boat, you have a chance to win the grand prizes. To get signed up or for additional information, visit TrilogyOutdoorsMedia.com and click on Event. Also, you can visit any of our way stations and registration stations to get signed up as well. Thanks to our wonderful sponsors, South Atlantic Bank, Surf Signs and Designs, Bass Pro Shops, Trilogy Outdoors Media, Visit Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and many more. Best of luck to everyone, and we'll see you at the scale. Trilogy Outdoors. All right, everybody. Welcome to Trilogy Outdoors Podcast, and uh, this week... Man, we kind of got an exclusive special going on, don't we? You, you've lined up a pretty cool guest. I, I'm just going to say, you know, we missed you last week, by the way, but I, I hope you got to listen to it. I did. It um, everybody did great. Yeah, it was good. It was everybody, good. everybody did great. We were at the NWTF banquet down in Georgetown, and uh, Stephen, unfortunately, was at Fort Stewart doing some training yeah. with the uh, National Guard Army, uh, Army Reserve. And uh, National Guard. National Guard. Yep. And we'll be at CCA tonight. That's right. Tonight, CCA banquet here in Merle's Inlet. Always a great time. Yeah. And uh, we, I've already been over there because we did the radio show this morning there. Right. Live. And uh, they are all set and ready to go. Super sized tent today uh, for this one. I think they're expecting a lot of people as always. And, and you know, the involvement in CCA um, should be incredible. And I'll tell you real quick, I filmed a show this week um, for the other show that I'm on Let's Fish TV and fished right on top of a shrimp boat that CCA sunk. And so when I get people that say, what does CCA do for me? I always want to say, well, listen, it's pretty easy. They take care with all the shit, oyster recycling that they're doing and the rebuilding of uh, structure in the inlets, but then all the reefs that they're adding to. Oh, yeah, that's that's a big thing. Um, in, in recent years, they've been dumping a lot of reefs. You know, and, and Scott and I have had this conversation, and Scott's been on here quite a few times too. Yep. And one of the... You know, priorities for me, at least, is to get more offshore material in in new permitted sites. Honestly, Inglis, I mean, we 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 are doing a great job. CCA is doing a great job. DNR is doing a great job, continuing to put more structure offshore. But we're we're piling more on top of more on top of more, and we really need to put structure in some different places. That's right. Well, I'm going to say, you know, there was a lot going on this week um, in in news. I know you had a busy week, but the hot topic in all media this week was the trial. The Murdoch trial, yeah. He um, was found guilty and convicted and sentenced, two consecutive life sentences. Um, I think it's appropriate 
uh, for full disclosure for everybody to know that I know the Murdochs and I know the defense attorneys and I know the prosecution. Right. And I know the judge. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Believe it or not. And he, I'm going to tell you what. He's a great guy. Boy, did he make some fans. Cl- Cliff Newman, um, great guy. His daughter's also a circuit judge. And uh, Jocelyn, and she's she's done a good job. Um, great family. I've enjoyed getting to know him over the course of the last 10 or 15 years. And um, he did it, I mean, from what I can tell. I didn't watch every single day because it was a little overwhelming, honestly. But right. um, from what I can tell and from what everybody's saying, uh, Judge Newman did a fantastic job. I, I, I think so as well. And, and I'm sure there'll be some arguments against that. <clears throat> maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Um, maybe from our guest today. Yeah, so let me introduce our, our guest, and then we'll hit the pause button, and we'll bring him in. Yep. Um, hopefully, it'll be seamless on on the listener <laughs> the listeners' end. It will be. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna have Dick Harpootlian on the show today, Inglis, and um, Dick and I have a complicated history. <laughs> and um, you know, Dick was the chairman of the Democrat Party for a long time, and um, and is now a Democrat senator with me. Uh, obviously, I'm a Republican senator. And so we've been on a lot, a lot of opposite sides of um, stories and conversations and laws and in history. And uh, but we respect each other tremendously, have really meaningful debates. Um, and I like the guy. I mean, honestly, it's a, it's okay. I I don't know how the public feels about politics anymore, but honestly, I think it's okay to like your opponents. Yep. And I consider him an opponent that I like. And I want to say this much, I, I, and I say it from an outsider, but I continue to say it and will continue to say it until somebody proves me different. But overall, watching you guys work, uh, albeit through the stupid Senate television and, and everything else, watching y'all work, it does look like y'all actually do work together in yeah. a lot of ways. The yeah. aisles, the, 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 that dividing aisle might not be as bad and as wide as it is in Obviously, in the well, federal. I mean, honestly, in most things, they're not divisive, partisan things. But on the few things there are, we got to go to war and sort of beat up on each other. But if if you can't come back together after those very partisan issues, then the other 98%, which is nonpartisan, becomes very, very difficult. Right. right? And you can't get there. So um, let's do this. It's time for us to bring him in. Hit the pause button. And okay. when y'all hear us next, we're going to have Dick Harpootlin online. We believe in the power of human potential. Each of us is born with it, powered by the 30 trillion cells that make us. Awakening it requires feeding our cells to be healthier, boost performance, and improve health span to live our best lives. Meet Healthy Cell. Nutrition supplements evolved. A microgel designed with essential nutrients you can absorb at the cellular level. Squeeze it, mix it, or blend it. Vitamins you can't absorb are a waste of money. Pills contain nutrients. Gels deliver them. An experience you'll love. Results you can measure. More natural without binders or fillers. The future of vitamins is pill-free. Feel the difference. It's time to reach your potential. All right, y'all, welcome back. As I mentioned earlier, we've got with us Dick Harpootlian, Senator Harpootlian, my colleague, my friend, and sometimes my opponent, but uh, <laughs> but my friend overall. And um, Dick, thanks for coming on the show today. Happy happy to be here. And uh, your listeners should know that you're one of the good guys in the Senate. Um, I can't say, say that about everybody, but he's uh, somebody that's fighting for his constituents. We do differ from time to time on issues, but um, we, we – we um, can can disagree without being disagreeable. That's right. That's right. And, you know, we've got a listenership of somewhere between 100 and 120,000 people on average. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people over the last year that we've been doing this. And the majority of the people love our content, which is outdoor themed. But what I continually hear more of is yep. I want to hear more politics, which <laughs> is a little confusing to me, honestly, having uh, being inundated with it on a daily basis. But that's what they want to hear. And when we, you know, uh, when we started talking about the Murdoch trial recently, your name popped up, and I think English or somebody asked me if I knew you, you, you and I said, yeah. yeah, I know him pretty well, actually. And um, so I know that you are involved in this trial, and you are, are you involved in the appeal already? Have you already committed to the appeal? 
Yeah, we committed to the appeal. As you know, we got 10 days to file that. Right. And, of course, we have the financial crimes we've got to deal with. Right. All right. So full disclosure for our listeners and for you to try to give you a little comfort, I, I'm going to ask some questions just for our – I mean, obviously, this thing has captivated the nation, maybe even the world, world. in the last month and a half, two months. And so I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to try. I'm going to attempt to ask you questions that would not threaten your appeal or obviously any confidentiality. So if you if I step over that line, just say I can't answer that or whatever. You know, just, but I'm going to attempt to, to do the best I can since you're in the middle of an appeal now. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. And you know how timid I am, right? <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> yes, yes, I do. For those of you who don't know, that's uh, being facetious. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. All right, so um, you and I go back a little ways. You um, forgive me if this is not the proper way of introducing you, but um, <laughs> you would be what I would have considered the Democrat hitman for South Carolina going way back. <laughs> You were the uh, the chairman of the party, and um, and a pretty darn good one, in my opinion. I mean, having been on the other side, and um, so you and I got, you know, you and I crossed paths in a lot of ways as I was, as I was running. There's that dog. <laughs> Son of a bitch. We've Hold got, on. Let good. me let me let me put him somewhere so this doesn't go on all fucking day. No, that's okay. You're good. Hold on. Oh, good. did I say fuck? I'm sorry. No, you don't worry about up. it. We, we, we don't have an FCC problem on the podcast. <laughs> okay, Absolutely not. No, Let you. me get him locked up somewhere. Apparently, he saw a squirrel run by the door. <laughs> Come on, Ray, Ray. You I, know what, Ray? Here, whoa, you stay down here. I'll go upstairs. Come here. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way to do it. Yeah, those squirrels get yeah. me all the time. Yeah. Yeah, oh, you look. won't be able to hear him up oh, there. Look. Hold on. Hold on one second. Let me get him <laughs> situated. Oh, okay. Look. There you go, buddy. There you go. <laughs> okay. This, this I'm, you know, my wife is in Slovenia, so I'm the sole custody and control of this little devil. Yeah, um, your, your wife's the ambassador to Slovenia. She's the U.S. ambassador to Slovenia. I'm very proud that of her. That is she's awesome. Doing a great job. Yeah. She's and, doing a great job in a, in a part of the world that's um, become dramatically different than we thought it would be. Uh, she, got, she went a year ago, February. Yeah. She was there a week when uh, the Russians invaded the Ukraine. Ukraine is only a few hundred miles away through um, Hungary. So, yeah, it's a mess. It's, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess, but um, we certainly appreciate her service to the nation. That's, that's a, you know, a lot of people think that's a, like a super sweet gig. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the truth is it is a lot of work and it's called, and it's a hell of a lot of money. Right? Yep. It costs money. And it's, I mean, you would, now she's working this after, well, it's, it's early evening there now, but she was working most of the day. Um, she's got some, it's a NATO country, so, and again, the NATO countries are united in their opposition to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but there's constant um, issues that arise between all the countries, and, you know, she's there to smooth out any sort of diplomatic issues. She's doing a great job. I'm that is very great. Proud of her. Super cool. Super cool. So did she have a history here uh, in, in the politics before she went over there? Well, um, I've known Joe Biden for 30 years. I think, you know, you may differ with his political positions, but he's really one of the good guys um, in, in the sense that he um, is honest as the day is long. You know, he became vice president. He's worth $250,000. He left the Senate. When he left being vice president, he was worth $240,000. So, I mean, he has never tried to profit off his office. He is, um, when my mom died, he called me. I mean, just, you know, as vice president out of the blue. Um, I mean, he's, you know, the old Strom Thurmond throwback in terms of constituents and really likes people and, um, and so when he, uh, we, and of course he loves Jamie, um, and he met, she met him probably 17, 18 years ago, but he loves her. And, you know, he wanted to know who we were big supporters and wanted to know anything she wanted. She was interested in being an ambassador and we, uh, he talked to her and they finally they decided Slovenia would be a good fit, small country, 2 million people. Everybody speaks English at the foot of the Alps, your two hour, uh, drive from Venice. I mean, it's perfect. When we, w before the war, it would have been a great place to just, you know, take weekend trips and, you know, sort of do the garden party thing, but yeah. that's, that's not the gig anymore. It's become something different. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Something totally yeah. different. Yeah, All right. Okay. So I'm going to jump back to Murdoch if I can. Um, the dog, the dog is dealt with. This is an outdoor podcast, so no problem with the dog. People, yeah. people love dogs in this, in, in this show, but, um, uh, so, Mur Murdoch, you you 
were in. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually Murdoch. Yeah, yeah. Or <laughs> hey, say it right, <laughs> Murdoch. It has and, been. And I've, had to, I've had to train myself. It's Murdoch. Yeah. Okay. Mur- okay. I will, we'll we'll get it right as best we can. You, you don't have to. It's like my name. I mean, nobody pronounces it correctly. But go ahead. Right. So somewhere along the way, you got involved. You've known Alex for a long time, though, right? I have not. Let me let me give you the history. It's sort of fascinating. In 1975, I became an assistant solicitor here in Columbia. Yeah. The solicitor in Hampton, Carlton. Uh, I guess it's Barnwell and you know, Jasper and Buford. Right. That circuit down there was a guy named Buster Murdaugh, who it, you know, ended up being the longest service serving DA or solicitor in the country. Um, and he was old back in 1875. And as a young assistant, my boss, Jim Anders, had me uh, coordinate um, legislative issues uh, through Buster. Uh, Buster would call me or call Anders and tell me to go over and see Mr. Blot. Um, uh, he would, he would, um, uh, had me carry messages. And anyway, it, it, I became sort of a conduit to the legislature for him. Um, and he just treated me great. So when I left um, the solicitor's office in 83 after the Gaskins case, I, I went into practice with Jack Swirling and then I ran for solicitor. When I got elected, Randolph Murdahl, that would be Buster's son, Alex's father, was a solicitor down there. And he and I became pretty good buddies. I mean, I got to be frank with you. I think Alec may have worked in the solicitor's office as a as a in PTI or something when he was in law school, but right. you know I don't uh, you know I had a, dozens and dozens of folks who did summer work and clerk work I didn't know, um, but he I think they have worked in my office, um, and then um, so I was pretty good friends with Randolph his father, and so when Paul got charged in the boat case the infamous boat case, it, uh, Alec talks to uh, his father and his father said, hired Dick Harpootian. So I went down to uh, Moselle, interestingly enough, and met with Alec and Paul and Maggie and, and uh, um, Randolph. And, you know, I discussed the case with them. So I got involved in that case and I brought Jim Griffin, who does a number of cases with me, civil and criminal. And, and so um, that basically began my relationship with Alec. I, I did not know him prior to that. I mean, I, when I say I didn't know him, I knew his father really well. Um, but, but, and then, you know, Jim and I started working on the boat case, met with Alec and Maggie and Paul innumerable times, some of them in my office, if they were up here to go to Carolina baseball or football or some sort of basketball, they loved Carolina athletics, all of them, all three did. Um, and so, you know, I spent a lot of time with Paul and Maggie and Alec. Yeah. And, and so that's how I met them. And of course, then, uh, Maggie and Paul were murdered in uh, June of, um, 2021 all right and at the time of the the boating engagement when when you went to see them at moselle there was no indication of any any background problems leading up to this right i mean there was none none no i look uh, we talked to alec and maggie and paul i know jim did and i think i did too within a week of their their murders and everything i mean they were holding hands the last time they left my office yeah yeah yeah, well, that I mean, I think that came out in the trial, and I, I'd, I'd like to get into a little bit of that, but I think that came out in the trial that he, I think he genuinely, at least from my perspective, it looked like he genuinely cared about his family. Yep. He did. You know? No, no, then of course, no but nobody would argue, and no, no witness, not a single witness testified on behalf of the state that there were anything but, I mean, even when, even the dog, the guy that ran the dog kennel for him described him as lovey-dovey. I mean, it's just, they were, the, the text messages between them, the, everything would never, ever a single. Now, Alec had a drug problem. Maggie knew about it. She was not happy with him about him taking the Oxycontin. Um, but he, you know, he functioned, he made, you know, seven figures every year in that law practice over the 10 year period that he was addicted to Oxycontin. Um, and, uh, there's no, no, not a single instance in which he lost his temper or did anything on toward towards anybody physically or otherwise while I was on the Oxycontin. Unfortunately, during that same period of time, it would appear that he, uh, uh, stole about ten million dollars of clients funds yeah yeah so so no indication that you were going to be representing him on anything else at the time that he hired you on the boating case right? no just Paul yeah just Paul and and so when you decided to take this case did did you approach it like every other case or was it more personal absolutely okay. no no I, 
I n- don't represent friends. I don't represent family. I, yeah. you know, if, if, if you had a brain tumor, would you go with the, uh, the, uh, brain surgeon that, you know, you've known all your life and friends with your parents, or would you go with the, the, the person that has a reputation for being the best, the, the you know, the cold calculating cutter. Yeah. And that's what I want to be. I want and I, and I've done it for almost half a century. Um, I don't represent friends and family. I don't get involved in cases where, have any emotional attachment to anybody in the case yeah. and i think if you if you do that then you don't you know you don't get enthralled with your client you don't get protective of your client right um and and that's not what you're there to do you're there to challenge in a criminal case the state's case and show that they can't prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and mm. um you know we did everything we could in this case unfortunately once the judge let the uh, the financial fraud stuff in and the specifics of it, you know, he stole money from disabled kids. He stole money from a paraplegic. He stole money from allegedly stole money from um, uh, a guy with pancreatic cancer, allegedly stole money. I mean, just, you know, if and so by the time that two and a half weeks in, that's all the jury had heard. By the time they got to the um, he says this happened, he had no credibility. Yeah. And so. Um, and that's one of the issues we're appealing as to whether or not any of that financial stuff should have been let in. So, so what do you say? I've heard heard a lot of people over the last couple of weeks ask me, you know, how, how how does this guy represent people that are horrible people? How, how do you answer <laughs> these? How do you answer these people? Because I've I've been asked that question before. Okay, well, you and I both took an oath. Yeah. And I know oaths don't matter much anymore to many people. They just say well, that's silly. But silly they should. Stuff. But they should. But they should. You know, we took an oath to rep- if we if we undertake the representation of somebody that we're going to do it to the best of our ability. We're not making judgments about whether they're in most instances, whether they're innocent or guilty. We're going to put the state to the test of proving them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I always point out that John Adams, the second president of the United States, when they're in the with in the in the uh, Boston ma- massacre event where a number of British soldiers shot down and killed colonial protesters in Boston. He represented six of them. Yeah. He, John Adams, yeah. and I think four were acquitted and the other two got some sort of civil fine but um, or some minor sentence. Look, Abraham Lincoln represented 22 murder cases. Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. I mean, we took an oath um, to represent these people. Now, you don't cheat. You don't suborn perjury. You don't make up evidence. You don't do anything to win. So if you stick by the oath, if you stick by... Uh, you know, we as attorneys can always come up with a better story for our client than they have, but you don't do that. Yeah. And if you do it ethically, if you do it the way it's supposed to be done, um, and the other side plays plays fair, um, then um, you know justice will be had. They, it's, you know, everybody's presumed this is the, the same Constitution that's got the Second Amendment in it. Um, Everybody talks about the Second Amendment. It's also got the Fifth Amendment and the Fourth Amendment, which guarantees your 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 uh, premises and uh, your person free from the government taking either right. without due process of law. So I don't understand why people want to pick and choose the amendments they want to support. So the did, did you ever know there was a lawyer in Horry County, uh, practiced for a long time, great guy named Pat Henry. Did you ever remember him? I remember him. Yeah. He was a fantastic lawyer. He died a couple of years ago and um, it looked like surgical error, by the way, medical malpractice. I, I don't want Jeez. to say that for sure, but he definitely died immediately after a surgery. And um, anyway, years ago, his son and, and myself, we were friends. We went to school together and um, his son was in a terrible accident. The driver, he was the passenger. The driver was drunk. They were coming from a party. Driver uh, swerved off the road, hit a tree, and killed Pat's son. His name was Patrick. He was a friend of mine. He died 20-something years ago. Terrible accident. Pat was a great lawyer at the time, and, of course, he was devastated. But I rem- the thing I remember the most about this was that Pat participated in the defense of the, of the kid that killed his son. Wow. Jeez. You know, I mean, it, it just it takes incredible stones to do something like that. Not not only showing what a um, what a person, what a human being, what a you know, really a reflection of a Christian ethic, but also a lawyer willing to stand up and help in the defense of the killer of your son. I mean, it it was just a it was an incredible piece of work. And um, I really admired him ever since then. But anyway, just an aside, people do hard stuff. And this this was 
this was probably a difficult I'm, I know it was a difficult case, Dick. I've tried murder cases before, and, you know, a week-long murder case will wear you out. This one was four weeks, five weeks? Six. 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 Weeks? six, six. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, I tried the Gaskins case, mm. uh, Pee Wee Gaskins prosecuted Oh, that that's all. Awesome. In, yep. in 1983, uh, it yeah. lasted five weeks. Yeah. Four weeks after it was over, I quit. Yeah. The Swiss office because I was just beat like a dog. Yeah. 40 years later, here I am, 74 years old. This case is supposed to last three weeks. It went six. And I got to tell you, the physical, uh, the physicality of trying a case for six weeks is tough, especially for old guys. It's but, hard. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's very hard getting up at 430 in the morning, getting ready for the, you know, what's going to happen that day, working all weekend, getting, you know, trying to get to bed early, and then you find something you need to go look at again. It will wear you out. I got to tell you, here it is, Saturday about noon, 1230. And after I hang up from talking to you, I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> that's, 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 you know, I've got I've got requests from every network yeah. in the country to come on this afternoon or night, and my answer is no. Yeah. I need a nap. Yeah. I need to reach. And of course, uh, Steve, I'll be back with you all in the Senate next week. It's not like I can take a week or two off and go to the beach. I mean, I'm just that's right. This is a this is going to be phys- physically tough for me now and for the next couple of weeks until I get get my mojo back. There, there's. Um, I've done a lot of hard, like physically challenging things in my life, including army stuff and, you know, Citadel and whatnot. And I, and I can tell you there is nothing more physically challenging than, than a week and a half, two weeks, six weeks of a mental challenge, like a trial. I don't know why, it's, it, why that it, is. It, it's just, well, it, it's because you have to stay focused. It's the mental focus that will wear your ass out i mean you know walking around the courtroom isn't going to do it but you know again the hours you have to put in and then once you get in the court i actually lost weight during this trial yeah think about that i mean and i was not eating healthy yeah we stopped at um um what the hell's the name of that place on the interstate for lunch yesterday um Cracker Barrel, okay? Mm-hmm. What are you going to eat in Cracker Barrel? <laughs> fried, have, what, fried chicken. <laughs> fried chicken. The new... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but what I'm saying is I lost weight even not eating well. And yeah. Um, yeah. and it's not like you can work out. I mean, it's just – so it will wear your ass out. And it's the focus you have to keep to make sure they don't get something in that you didn't – I mean, you don't catch it. You've got to be quick on your feet. Um, it's – uh, but but let me say this, and 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 I say this because I love trying cases. I mean, I, I've been doing this for almost half a century, and I wake up every morning wanting to go do this. I mean, it is more fun to me when I say fun. Like you know, if you're a football player, a football game would be if you're good at it, fun and and you know a lot of preparation, a lot of all that. But actually. Um, when I, it's, it's an enjoyable intellectual exercise. Um, it's a lot of work, but I enjoy doing it. And whether it's civil or criminal, um, you know, I've prosecuted about 12 death penalty cases. I've defended two. Uh, I've had one person, Gaskins, I prosecuted, executed, and I had one I defended, executed. Um, but, you know, again, it's, you may play for the Yankees this week and the Red Sox next week if you're in baseball. Um, it's, I'm not wed to a particular – I think people that, that are wed to a particular – oh, I'm a prosecutor. I can never defend anybody yeah. or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, they, they forget what was the oath we took. Yeah. I mean, I've been appointed to represent some horrible people that did horrible things. Um, but they got, you know, 150% out of me, just like, you know, anybody pays me a lot of money to, to represent them and somebody I, I like, or I think you can't, you can't pick it. You could pick your choose your cases based on, oh, I like them or I don't like them. But uh, I find that eliminates your ability to, to test your skills in a courtroom against the other guy. So it's not a philosophy. It's more like an intellectual challenge. Absolutely. Look, uh, you know, again, I prosecuted for 12 years. I was a solicitor here. Um, I enjoyed it. I, I really loved it. Um, but uh, defending cases has, you know, it's the whole other side is also has tremendous uh, uh, satisfaction. And, you know, I took those trial skills that I learned on the criminal side and applied them to the civil side. Um, and I got to tell you, um, it's resulted in literally tens of millions of dollars of jury verdicts. Um, and the other day I participated in cases civil cases 
uh, that resulted in almost a half a billion dollars in settlements. Yeah. Now, I mean, I, you know, they weren't my, me alone. A number of the cases I had co-counsel or other firms involved um, still made a pretty, pretty good buck or two out of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, but what I'm saying is those skills are transferable to any civil courtroom. Uh, uh, and, and then you, you know, then you can translate that into some real dollars, but, um, I am not, I mean, obviously sometimes your, your, your personal position, uh, is the same as your client's position. Sometimes it's not. Mm. So in this case, let, let's, let's talk some specifics if we can about this case. So what, sure. what, what did you sort of perceive in the beginning, when you're evaluating a case, you know, you think, well, there's strengths, there's weaknesses, there's some things in between, there's some things that can change. And in this case, in the beginning, what did you perceive sort of as the strengths and the weaknesses of the case? Well, I mean, initially, when they indicted him for murder, I mean, and this came out during the trial, their main piece of evidence was that Alec had you know, the white T-shirt they confiscated the night of the murder, they took into evidence, um, on the white T-shirt, he had what's called um, high velocity blood spatter. That is a very fine mist of blood um, on his uh, T-shirt, which would indicate he had been uh, very close to somebody and shot him with a probably a, a shotgun. Well, of course, Paul's dead of a shotgun. And so they did what's called a presumptive test. That's just sort of a, uh, you know, is it, could it be blood? Because it could also be bleach. It could be detergent. It could be a number of other things. And But it showed positive, positive for blood. So that was initially um, what um, what what they took to the grand jury along with some other stuff that wasn't exactly true. But they, that's I mean David Owen presented it, and that's what he said you know, he presented. And that well, would and that would have been a weakness in the beginning, right? Well, well, no, I mean that would have been a weakness for. I mean, it looked, that's, that's not good evidence when you got the dead kid's blood on your shirt. Right. So we we in evaluating we said that's not good. But let's let's dig in and find. We talked to an expert who said. Um, if all they have is that presumptive test, did they run the confirmatory test, which is called hematrace? Mm -hmm. We looked at the records they'd given us. We didn't see it. So, so we know they hired an expert, a guy named Tom Bevel out of Oklahoma, whose specialty is going around the country and testifying about blood spatter. And he initially said, oh, it, it wasn't blood spatter. Then Sweat flew out um, and, um, and met with him. And then he came back with a report saying it was blood spatter. Now, there's a young lady that works for me named Holly Miller. She's been with me for 27 years, and she worked She worked harder than all of us put together. And she was going through the discovery that the state furnished us, and um, and it's all electronic these days. And, I'm, you know, I grew up in the banker's box um, file folder stuff, but now it's all electronic. And she did a search uh, just for Bevel's name. We put it in a database, and you can search by name by any term you want. His name was Bevel, and she found a what's called an MOI, Memorandum of Interview, a guy named, I think, John Rhodes or Thomas Rhodes. And she thought that was weird because those are those are interviews sweat agents do with witnesses. Yeah. So she went and opened it, and inside that file folder was a draft report by Bevel in which he found no blood spatter, mm -hmm. which was an eye-opener. So we really focused on it after that, yeah. and we really scrubbed all the sweat records, and we got like they say a terabyte we probably got a million documents in this case out of them which we loaded in the databases um and what we found was now murder happens in june june 7th 21 the uh the the preliminary test the uh, the 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 one that shows it's you know presumptive that is could be blood could be a number of other things is done like two or three weeks later we find out that they run the confirmatory test in August and it says no human blood found. Mm. They then issue a written report in November saying no human blood found. They didn't tell the expert. Their, 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 their defense was, and, and Owen, the chief investigating officer, says, well, I don't even look that stuff unless they email me. Um, and they ended, and there was some record they did email me, him. So he, I mean, this is what we called the dog ate my email defense they had but but the bottom line is in november of last year we filed a motion to exclude the any mention of uh, blood spatter um and at that point owen claims that's when he found out there was no blood human blood found creighton waters and i believe that creighton's an ethical good guy yeah. um says that's the first nobody told him i don't believe they told him so we thought that they had to retool and of course they found that video 
uh, from the dog kennels. And Alec had an explanation. He testified to it. Um, but after what we didn't believe would happen was that the judge would let all that two and a half weeks of financial fraud in. So Once that happened, he was cooked. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I do want to focus on that a little bit because to me, you know, as an outsider not being there, not having been involved in any of y'all's conversations at all, um, to me it seemed like once the financial stuff came in and the, I think anybody, any objective viewer could say the jury at that point in time deems him to be a liar, right? Right. Oh, and a thief. And a thief. I mean, just a thief. And stealing from people, vulnerable people. And, right. And, you know, Steve, the, the, the problem is the only way you get that in is is to prove motive. That is, that yep. he thought he was going to be discovered and right. all this would come out. Well, there's two problems with that. One, they don't have to prove motive. Two, there was a specific financial transaction called the Ferris case where there was some question about whether he had taken the money um, uh, and not given it to the firm. Uh, and he had, but... Um, that's what started all this on a Monday and he had a hearing on the boat case where he was going to have to reel the finances on Thursday, which it turns out there was, the, the hearing was not even the plaintiff's lawyer, Mark Dinsley testified Thursday wasn't going to be a big deal, but they, that's what they argued to the judge motive. He went home and killed uh, Maggie and Paul to distract from uh, and, and delay that hearing. Well, I mean, that's just utterly unbelievable. Yeah. And so they use that as a hook. The judge bought it to get all that in. And then uh, last, uh, I guess, when did we argue this thing? Thursday, Friday, Friday, Thursday, Thursday. Um, the final argument by the state was, you know, we don't have to prove motive. Don't worry about that. Yeah. It's not really relevant here. So at the front end, it was the most important piece of evidence they had to have. At the end, they said, don't worry about it. So sort of a judicial bait and switch. Yeah. Um, and we think that's a great appellate issue. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like it might be. Honestly... I mean, if I had to point out the biggest weakness in the case, again, as an outsider observer, motive just makes no sense to me on this case. I mean, it makes yep. no sense to me whatsoever. And there, there is an age-old motive for killing your spouse. Everybody knows that. I mean, it's divorce, it's money, it's infidelity, whatever it might be. There is an age-old motive for killing your spouse. But it takes a real sick individual to kill your own kid. Like a, a real sick individual. Yes. Right? And, well, and, 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 and he did that to distract from, uh, you know, what he, I mean, everybody viewed as a non-issue on Thursday. It, I mean, that, that never made any sense. Still it, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me. I, now, I'm, 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 again, I'm trying to be objective here as the, as the interviewer. You're I'm, doing, you're doing better than me. That's why I'm glad you're asking the question. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just telling you that part doesn't make sense to me. I'd love to know what a motive is. Why? I mean, is there, is there an outside party that we don't know about? Was he involved in some really bad stuff, cartel type stuff that we weren't? I mean, I, I need to know the rest of the story <laughs> and I bet the jury won't, wants to know the rest of the story. Well, here, but here, but they probably don't because, um, tired of it. Can you all hold, can you all hold two seconds? Can you hold Absolutely. two seconds? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Inglis, what are you, you're, you're obviously on the other side. I, I, I'm okay. I'm not on the other side. Um, so here, here for, first and foremost, from, from, you know, my time of picking it up and starting to watch it first and foremost, uh, I thought that Dick and Jim did an unbelievable job of what they needed to do. Yeah. And, and I, what I tried to do was put myself as hey, a juror. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm back. Yeah, I'm back. that's no, okay. No I, try, I tried to put myself. Uh, I, I'm answering a question Steve asked real quick, but I, I put myself as a juror, yeah. and, and when I got to watch everything I watched, I tried to make myself as much, you know, uh, as that person sitting with the twelve over there, and, and I, could, I never ever was convinced that he did it. I mean, I, at, at no point in, in all of the trial that I watched, and I watched a lot of it. Yeah. Never was I convinced. Uh, I mean, I, I was surprised. But so, so, Dick, let me let me just ask you this then. I mean, we're we're obviously, I think we're n narrowly focused on you know the point <laughs> the point that everybody wants to know. I mean, if you were able to sort of articulate a theory of what happened to the jury, whether it be admissible or not, I mean, just whatever theory you want to articulate to a jury. I mean, what would it be? How do you explain this? What's the motive or, or the non-motive, I guess? The non-motive. Yeah, what, what, well, what if, happened? If you, I mean, if you assume it's not him, yeah. then somebody, somebody, and I, I, I believe that what happened, I mean, Alec testified he was down there. Of course, the dog 
Channel video proved he was down there. He mm-hmm. wasn't down there long, and he headed back up to the house in the golf cart. Maggie would normally work in a in a shop, uh, which is literally around. And you'd have to understand the, the layout, but there's a there's a, 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 a wall probably 60 feet away from the dog pens, and on the other side of that wall, that area is covered with a with a red metal roof. On the other side is like a barn, okay, where she did little buttered around on things. I think she walked off, and she used to walk up and back from the kennels to the house. And somebody watching saw that, figured they had Paul alone. And um, and went in and uh, and interestingly, right be- right before Maggie's phone goes dead, she opens her camera as if she's getting ready to take a picture. Well, she's certainly not take- taking a picture of Alec killing the son. She's taking a picture of somebody she didn't know, and um, and then her phone goes dead, which means at nine fifty four or five, she probably was dead or being shot at. Mm-hmm. So um, that third party. Um, well, first of all, they've never, ever matched the shotgun, uh, the shotgun shells. They found the two uh, ejected shells, any weapon owned by anybody at Moselle, any, any, you know, any of the shotguns, any of the ejected shotgun shells. Mm-hmm. So I think somebody came there with a shotgun uh, to, to kill Paul. Um, and then um, it, Paul, Paul probably had his blackout down there somewhere because he had sent his, his car had gone to the shop the previous Friday and he carried guns, every vehicle he ever had. He had guns. I mean, he probably had the blackout, took it out down there at the shed, left it down there. Um, and so um, they, whoever was down there, it may, and I still think it's probably two people, um, picked up the AR and she comes, she hears the shotgun um, blast or she hears talking and comes around the corner. And then they open up on her. So I think it's a two-shooter scenario. I don't think it was Alec. Um, again, I, uh, I I actually viewed and watched for a year the relationship between him and Paul and him and Maggie. Now, if they said, we know all about you stealing the money, um, you know, we're going to turn you in. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, I don't think he'd even kill him then. I think he'd do what he only did in September and try to kill himself. Yeah. So... It, it, it doesn't make it, the, the, and the physical evidence, you know, all kinds of things sled screwed up and didn't do. So we really didn't get to gather any physical evidence. Yeah. Um, no fingerprints, no footprints. I mean, they, 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 they let tire tracks be run over. They didn't um, preserve. I mean, the major, which would have proved, could have proved Alec innocent, is he had um, GPS information on his phone um, and um, she had GPS information on hers. They recovered her phone primarily because Alec gave him um, uh, the code. He knew how to open her phone and it had been thrown out on the side of the road. It's another, why would he do that? He could open the phone and see if there's anything in there. And why do you throw it on the side of the road? Why don't, whoever took the guns, they've never been found, certainly would take that, with, with, however they dispose of the guns, unless they took the guns with them. Maybe they want, just wanted to get rid of something to be tracked. But they took it into custody the morning after the murders. And... Put it in put it in airplane mode i learned a whole bunch about cell phones <laughs> in this case um but if you don't put it in what's called a faraday bag which is something that, that will keep any um uh, electronic signals coming into the phone um the the gps place the gps data is kept will override after a week uh five days it will overridden a big chunk of the GPS data in there. So when they finally downloaded it, they had no GPS data prior to June 9th. And that was just amazing to us. They would, every expert we talked to um, said, everybody puts those in a Faraday bag to keep, to basically seal it away from being tampered with electronically. I mean, somebody could go in, even in, in, um, in airplane mode, go in and wipe everything remotely. So, um, because of that, we couldn't say, well, um, Maggie's phone's here, Alex's phone is there. All right, so what what you believe to be the worst thing that came in that should not have come in is the financial crimes? Financial crimes, no okay. question about it. And, and what do you believe should have come in that should not have come in? If, if you had your brothers, what should have come in, number one piece of evidence that should have come in, that could have proven his innocence, that did not come in? 
Well, you know, it's a circumstantial case. So um, we had, you know, inconsistencies in their timeline, inconsistencies um, in a number of things. But we, since we didn't um, conduct the investigation, there was, wasn't a lot of evidence we could find um, on our own. Um, that, that Now, there was a guy named Eddie Smith who was a drug dealer, no question about it, a guy that also um, um, was the one that shot Alec in the head at his request yeah. so that he could collect on his, his life insurance. Um, he, obviously, if a guy, I mean, you've got some homicidal issues if um, he uh, is willing to, after uh, 10 minutes asked, uh, after Alex asked him to shoot him in the head, he shoots him in the head, obviously trying to murder him or kill him. Um, he also failed the polygraph. This is in papers we filed. He followed the follow, failed the polygraph that Sled gave him when they asked him, did you kill Maggie and Paul? He failed that. I mean, we, we had hoped that um, the problem is, hmm. You know, you, you can't call a third party who's under yeah, arrest. That's right. Um, they got Fifth Amendment rights, and um, we tried to wiggle around that, just couldn't get it. Uh, well, that, in third party guilt. That, that's what I was going to ask you, if you had a suspect. And so you, clearly you do. Your, your suspect is this this guy, this suspect. The, what's his name again? Yeah. Smith? Eddie Smith. Eddie Smith. Eddie Smith. Eddie Smith. Yeah. Uh -huh. So clearly you had a suspect. You just couldn't. I mean, he's going to take the fifth, obviously. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. All right. So that's great. What? Let me ask you a sort of a, a, an amorphous, esoteric question that I get asked um, quite a bit, and I'm sure people would want to know. Have you ever asked a client whether or not he or she was guilty after after the case? After the case? Yeah. Or do you care? No. I don't care. You don't? Nope. Okay. So clearly you didn't ask him in this case. I wouldn't ask you what the question, what the answer was. Right. Just, well, I mean, he, he indicated to the judge, he did not kill me. He's an innocent man. And he, by the way, he's continued to tell us that, by the way, I don't ask him before the case. Yeah. Oh no, no. I wouldn't ask anybody before the case either. Yeah. No. I, and I understand why. Right. Well, t tell, tell the, tell the audience. Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to know? Okay. So let's say I did it. Okay. I, I said, I tell, I tell the lawyer I did it. Well, yeah. then the lawyer's faced with this conundrum. It's not really a conundrum. A lawyer cannot knowingly suborn perjury. Right. So if the guy takes a stand and tells some story that's inconsistent with, I did it, um, we have rules that say you can't help him. You can't question him. Um, you know, and that's the, that's the tell. All of us know when the lawyer puts the guy up and the guy testifies and the lawyer says no questions. Yeah. Um, so you can't further that, allow on the court. You can't further perpetrate allow on the court. And and I don't think you can argue his story in final argument either. Yeah. So right. that's that's the tell that everybody in the courtroom except the jury knows he's told his lawyer he did it. Yeah, right. I mean that everybody wants to know that question, right? Everybody thinks he's told he's told the lawyer. And the the truth that I think everybody needs to understand is that's not. That that just does I've never asked a client that, and you clearly have never asked a client that because we would be in ethical trouble if it came out something different happens, right? See, though, see, you, you, you and I, again, we took an oath that, you know, we do everything within the bounds of the law right. to represent our client. And uh, people say, well, it's just, um, if he told you he did it, why can't you help him fashion a, a story or why can't you support his story? Yeah. Well, we got rules, and that, that, that's how I go to sleep every night and not worry about what I did that day uh, so, because I follow the rules. So are you, are you, um, you, you brought it up. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring it up. Are you sleeping? So very well last night. Not enough. <laughs> um, not enough. That's and good again, to hear. when we hang up, I'm taking a nap. Uh, you know, I, it's that, that's just cause I wore my ass out six weeks. Yeah. Well, I knew, I know the, cause I know you. I, so I know, I know the answer to that question, but a lot of people were going to say, well, how does that son of a bitch sleep at night? I know the answer to that is very well, I suppose. Very well. Thank you. We right. can't, I we mean, again, 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 if you play by the rules, yeah. if you do your ethical duty, if you uphold your oath, then you have no regrets. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, from, uh, from uh, obviously an outsider, uh, not understanding law the, the way y'all do, uh, the gallery that I had with me, because I was normally uh, in front of the TV with a couple people. We were watching, and we were just like, we kept, we kept referring to the fact that, you know, we're watching, what, nine hours in the courtroom, whatever, on TV. But, you know, as soon as Dick and Jim get out of here, they're going home. They got they got to work. Yeah. They got they got to work for tomorrow. And yeah. you know it's it's just I mean, 
almost probably, I, I mean, I would guesstimate a 20 to 22 hour job a day. Yes. What y'all were going well, through? Well, I mean, it's, you know, I'm, again, I am 74. I got to have at least six hours sleep. So, but it's, you know, you do that. And then we came home on the weekends and, you know, you got to sleep in on Saturday morning and Sunday morning. Uh, not, but still you're up. The problem is I was in the office all day Saturday and everybody needs to understand this isn't the only case I had. Yeah. So I've got, you know, to keep the other cases uh, going and answer interrogatories and get stuff done, direct people in my office, get stuff done. So, you know, it's, 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 and again, we had, there were, um, I think, uh, I think there were, we had four lawyers and uh, two support staff. That's six people. The AG had all the sled, you know, they had seven lawyers in the courtroom. They had all kinds of, you know, support people. Uh, but, you know, I don't complain about that because they got the burden. As that's long right. as the rules are followed and the decisions are, are sound, that's, that's fine. That's a fair fight. Yeah. But, you know, in this case, I think the evidence came in that should not have come in um, that, that, you know, that prejudiced the jury to the point that we couldn't get a fair trial. So what, what's your best argument on appeal? There's two arguments. One is under 404, 403 rules, um, you know, you can't um, introduce, these weren't even convictions prior bad conduct mm -hmm. as character evidence. In other words, he did these bad things, so he probably did this bad thing, or he did these bad things and showed you shouldn't believe a word he says. It can only be introduced for several things. One would be motive. And again, they played, uh, I think they played uh, judicial bait and switch here. And even if they were to allow it in, there was one transaction on that Monday that he thought he might get, I mean, their argument is he thought he might get caught on when he had to testify um, on Thursday. It, it should have limited to that one seven hundred ninety thousand um, dollar transaction. I don't think that even should have come in. But I, I think the, the the law is clearly on our side. The second, um, and I think uh, even a better error, we believe the judge made during the cross examination of Alec by Creighton. Um, he, you know, he found out about this. Um, um, what we call the kennel video where he thought, you know, here in, in the background, you can, everybody knows it's how Maggie talking about whether the dog had gotten a chicken or a guinea. Um, and they, by the way, they sound very convivial at that point, which sure. is, according to the state, 12 minutes before, or no, eight minutes before he uh, executes his wife and son. But the issue there is <laughs> Creighton kept asking him, are you known about this? Why didn't you tell somebody? Why didn't you tell the police this story? Well, <laughs> post arrest, um, you know, the question of I the mean, post arrest, this is that he found out about it after you've been arrested on the murder. You, you have a right to remain silent. That's Fifth Amendment. That's right. So commenting on his failure to come forward and comment or explain while uh, prior to trial, why'd you wait till trial? He said, well, that is a comment on his, his, uh, his silence, but he has a right to remain silent. Fifth Amendment, Doyle is the U.S. Supreme Court case, almost exactly the same circumstances, which the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court reversed. Yeah, I mean, wow. I, it sounds like a good argument, uh, Dick. I, I, I commend you. I think that's I mean, to me, it makes sense, right? I'm gonna. Um, I know that we're gonna have an opportunity to speak with the prosecution at some point too, and so I'm gonna ask them on that. And I'd, I'd like to hear their response. But I like your argument. I think it sounds like a pretty good one. Um, well, the, their their responses will be what they always say, which is, "Oh, it's harmless error." Yeah, it was error. If it was error, <laughs> it, it, there was so much other evidence. Yeah, you know, it's but <clears throat> yeah, the U.S. Supreme Court is very and very very strict on Doyle violations. All right, before I let you go, I would be a fool not to ask you about Pee Wee Gaskins, and I mean oh, that—that that was my job. I, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Were you going to ask about well, Pee Wee? Real quick, I'm from Lake City. Okay, I'm yeah. from Lake City. Okay, and are you and, are you are you can are you can to Pee Wee? Everybody over there is can to. Okay, I I hope not. <laughs> thank God I am not. But I am going to say this much: that as a child at nine years old, I was at the fast fair, which was two blocks away from my house. And I remember the hearse pulling up in front of the fast fair and him getting out and yeah. people telling me the stories about him. And I countless times over the next year saw the hearse and then remember when they started finding the bodies, they got him arrested. And um, I know a lot of his family members I actually went to college with a daughter, I think, uh, at Francis Marion. But I do know a lot about the case. I've been to uh, the, one of the burial grounds out in... Uh, Oh, gosh, outside of Lake Prospect. City. Prospect. 
prospect. In prospect, yes, uh, yeah. near uh-huh. the trees. Uh, so. But I, I, I was obviously really close to all that. So, so tell, tell us a quick story about Pee Wee Gaskins, then we'll let you go take a nap. I'll give you the, the, the one minute version, which okay. is okay. Pee Wee um, killed a bunch of people for and all of them. I mean, he wasn't a serial killer. He had a reason for, I mean, they were people he knew primarily. Um, they, he thought they, uh, uh, you know, couldn't be trusted after they helped him steal something or, um, you know, there was, uh, we don't need to go on. He killed a pregnant woman and child because the pregnant woman was pregnant by a black man and the child was biracial. So, uh, I mean, I talked about it one time. He said they wouldn't want to live if they thought about it, soiled by a black man. Um, anyway, he got caught for three of them or four of them and was convicted and sentenced to death. Um, Furman versus Georgia, the, case, the U.S. Supreme Court case that negated the death penalty basically in every state because it had, you know, you had to have a separate se- uh, trial on guilt or innocence and then one on sentencing. So his char- his death penalty got reversed. Kenny Summerford, the solicitor over in Florence County, um, who I knew well, convinced Pee Wee that they could retry him. And it was sort of an open question, uh, <clears throat> get him resentenced to death. But he said, <clears throat> if you will tell us about all the bodies you've done or all the people you killed, um, we'll let you plead to life. And back then, you know, you're eligible for parole after 10 years on life. So Pee Wee told him about 10 murders and they found the bodies, they dug them up um, and he got 10 life sentences. He went to CCI where he was the building man, the head trustee in the cell block. And these cell blocks look like something out of the thirties. I'm talking about, you know, multi-level cell block, like at Alcatraz, right. they weren't modern you know, sliding, locking doors, those kinds of things. So right. death row was one of the tiers on one of the sides of 15 people in there, including a guy named Rudolph Tyner, who had killed uh, a couple named Moon at their convenience store in um, Horry County. Um, and um, he had executed them during an armed robbery. The Moons had a son named Tony Simo, who was a brick mason. And um, he was very, he, he was their adopted son, very upset about it. Um, and um, you know, uh, Tyner was tried, sentenced to death. The Supreme Court reversed it because of uh, shockingly, Steve will know this. Um, the solicitor made improper comments in his final argument. Um, <laughs> so he was retried, resentenced to death, and years had gone by. Simo just snapped, called a friend of his named Jack Martin, who had done time at CCI. I said, I want the guy dead. How do I do it? He said, I got just the guy for you. Pee Wee Gaskins. Tyner was black. Um, Pee Wee was racially intolerant would be an understatement yeah. and he'd killed white people. And so anyway, long story short is Pee Wee communicated with Simo by phone. We know because Pee Wee tape recorded every one of his phone calls, arranges to, to uh, poison uh, Tyner if they'll smuggle some poison in. He gives him the poison and then there's this conversation where he's talking to Simo saying he just makes him sick. He said, you get me a stick of dynamite and a blasting cap. There won't be no coming back from that. Simo's <laughs> response is... I'll get you some, I can get you some plastic. And he can say, oh, that'll work. So he smuggles in a quarter pound of C4 and a blasting cap. And Pee Wee fabricates this uh, because he befriended Tyner. He had to yell through this vent in the back of his cell to the to Tyner's cell. What do you, can I get you some food or marijuana, you know, reef or whatever. So he rigged up this, what looked like an intercom. It was a cup with a um, speaker glued on the top of it. And a, a, since he was a building man, he had, he fixed all the electrical work and all the plumbing. He had a soldering iron. He had everything he need, needed to make this thing work. And um, so he had a, a buddy of his carry it over and deliver it to Tyner, told him to plug it into the wire he'd run through the two cells and hold it up to here and see if you can hear me. On the other hand, he plugged it into a 110, blew Tyner's head off and his hand off. It was pretty grotesque. Um, Figured out how to so kill somebody did, in the original, prison. original report, I was a, the assistant deputy Swiss at the time, was a time to try to blow his way out of a cell with some ma- a mastic bomb. The FBI came in, immediately determined it was C4, which set off all kinds of alarms. How much C4 is there in the yeah. maximum security facility um, for the state, CCI? So uh, Al, a guy named Al Waters uh, heard it was Pee Wee, took, went to Pee Wee's cell, had him strip naked and leave. There were 60, no wait. 32 separate um, uh, cassette tapes back when they had cassette tapes. And Al sat down and listened to them. It was about 15 minutes in that 60 hours or so um, of tapes where Pee Wee's talking to CMO and then arranging all this. You know, get me a, he said, get me a, uh, a stick of dynamite, a blasting cap, um, and it won't be no coming back from that. And then there's a call where after um, 
Tyler gets blown over. He's giggling about it. So it wasn't, uh, you know, Steve, that wasn't the most difficult case I ever prosecuted because the evidence was overwhelming. But we had to get a jury, which took four weeks, because you'd say, uh, Mr. Jury, you ever heard of Alfie Lee's Gaskins? Yeah, what do you know about him? Largest mass murder in the history of the state. Okay. <laughs> Could you put that aside and base your verdict and then, you know, on the facts and evidence? And then if they got past that, um, would you, knowing uh, he's the largest mass murderer in the history of the state, could you consider um, giving him a life sentence or you automatically get give him death? Hold on, hold on. It's got to be spam. Hold on. It's spam. Hold on. It's spam. So, so the fact of the matter hold is. On, hold on one yep. Do you remember that case? It was such yeah. a screwed up case. So his, so his death sentence that finally happened only came because of the yeah. murder that he That's, did in jail. Right, right. Yep. So, yeah, so, and, 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 Two weeks before he's being executed, he met with his son and instructed his son to kidnap my four-year-old daughter. I was a solicitor at the time yeah. and hold her hostage and get get call and get me to bring him up to the courthouse where he thought he could escape. And he probably would have. His son went to a friend of his and said, how about help me do this? That friend calls Billy Barnes, who was the sheriff of Florence County at the time. Uh, and Barnes had the son arrested um, and we left with, with a... Um, Sled, my four-year-old daughter, my wife, and I lived in the sled contingent of security for two weeks until we finally went to the electric chain. Wow. Such an incredible story. Yeah. Wow. Well, Dick, I told you it'd be 45 minutes, and we're at 53, so I'm going to let you go take a nap. But I really appreciate you coming on with us and, and telling well, us a little bit you're, of you're, the backstory. You're, you're a good friend, and you're, you're you know, obviously people out of here what you got to say, and I'm happy to accommodate you. Um Thank I you. will tell you this, you're special because I've had, you know, all kinds of requests for interviews today. And I said, told everybody else, I got to take a nap. So, well, <laughs> my mama, my mama used to say I was special too. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, y'all take care. And Steve, I'll see you on Tuesday, huh? Yes, sir. I'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks. Y'all take care. All right. Thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. All right. That was great. That, that was, was cool. Great. Yeah. That was really cool. And, uh, you know, in all my research that I've been doing, I did not even realize that he was part of the prosecution for Pee Wee. Mm -hmm. That is insane. Yeah, he um, he he told me that story a few times about how Pee Wee tried to have his daughter kidnapped, and I thought he might bring that up. It'd be a good part of the podcast. He he's an interesting guy, and as I mentioned in the beginning, this is um this is a guy. He and I have, we've had run-ins in the past. He, like I said, he was the hitman for the Democrat Party for years, and so, and and I, obviously, I mean that figuratively, right? <laughs> figuratively, right? Right. Um, so, you know, there's there's quite a few people that just plain out don't like Dick Harpootlian because he can be an asshole. You know, there's just yep. no better way of putting that. He he would admit that, but um, if you sit down and get to know him you can respect him for who he is and what he does. And he's an interesting guy. He, he really is. And he, he and I have become friends, even though we've crossed paths politically many, many times in the past. And I, I respect him. He's, a, if you, if you don't cross paths, neither one of y'all are doing your job. That's right. I mean, he, he is truly an operator. I mean that when there's no better way to put it, you know, <laughs> military terms, he's an operator, right? I mean, he, the guy knows what he's doing. If you, ever get charged with a crime, God forbid, he's the guy. And and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are really hard on criminal defense attorneys, really hard on them. And, um, and I think that comes from, I think that comes from a desire to want to see everybody as guilty, yep. honestly. But, you know, you're really hard on them until you really need one. Well, in the same sense, the wonderful thing about this country that we live in is due process. Yeah. And... Yeah. I mean, if, if if you go about it the right way and uh, uh, hire someone like Dick Harpootlian, whether you're guilty or not, you have a chance yeah. at, at at getting off. Yeah. You know, Dick and I actually worked on a, a murder case together um, a couple of years ago. And I had been practicing law for years by then. And, uh, you know, I, I thought I was a decent lawyer. And I... um. I participated in this murder case with Dick, and and within two or three days, I realized how much I didn't didn't know. know. Right, and I think that's a that's a part of becoming mature in whatever you do. Is you know the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. 
Um, but you know, he's an operator. He is sure, like surely good. Right. Well, one Seriously last thing, and I, I didn't want to put him on the spot. I didn't want to ask this question with him because I, I didn't want to put him on the spot. But so uh, I guess as we go on to hearsay, but uh, in in the media world, the last two days, obviously we've heard all about the appeal process. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that has been resounding through all the voices that I've heard is that typically in a situation this high profile, this that after the the findings uh, or the, the the judgment that that individual moves on to a completely different team because of the. Uh, severeness uh, or uh, the the uh, complexity of the appeal process yep. and uh, you will find a lawyers or a team that is you know specifically trained in that yeah that's right now this is a different scenario well it might be I I mean I so in the cases that I have participated in the past I've done quite a bit of appeals work, so I do some of my own, and a lot of lawyers do a lot of their own, especially if they've argued in front of the Supreme Court. I'm sure Dick has argued in front of the Supreme Court multiple times. I've argued in front of the Supreme Court. So I think, you know, I think they could do it. They know what they're doing, but, um, but there are nuances to appeals that somebody that does 100 appeals – in a year, that's probably not right. Somebody that does 25 to 50 appeals in a year versus somebody that does two appeals in a year pick up on. Right. And so having that appellate court attorney on the team of attorneys with the team of trial attorneys is, you know, if you can afford it, that's really the way to go. And obviously at some point in time it becomes cost prohibitive. But – um, which might be this case. It might be, right? I mean, it might be. Or it might just be such a high-profile case, everybody decides to work on it regardless. But the, the best-case scenario is to have the trial team working with the appellate court team in conjunction. And then somebody goes and does the oral argument. At the end of the day, you know, you either draw straws or you say, you've done more oral arguments than anybody. You're the best orator out of anybody. You know the case better than anybody. And you pick that right person to present the case at the Court of Appeals in the Supreme Court. Right. Right. But that might not be the trial team. That might be the appellate court lawyer. Now, now, uh, just can, uh, talk a little bit more about this case. So, Jim obviously did most of the direct mm -hmm. with um, Murdoch. Yeah. Uh, Jim did most of it. Did they? How do they figure that out? How do they decide? Is he better orator? Is that how you would say it? Is he better at that, or or did Dick just? <laughs> So, so in, in some of these trials that I've worked on in the past, you, you look at, you look at the, the amount of work that needs to be done and who's better at what, right? And you divide it up. Now, sometimes you might have two operators like, like Jim and Dick, great lawyers, probably equally as good on direct and on cross and on opening and on closing. And so they, you know, we, and we could have asked him that, but. Traditionally, behind the scenes, the way this works is, Stephen, you're super good at cross. You piss people off. You get people to admit stuff. Oh, Allie or whoever, you know, pick, pick a softer spoken person to do uh, the direct. You know, you're, you, you invoke sympathy or empathy. You know, I'm not the sympathy, empathy guy. I'm the guy that pisses you off. No, nope, we all know that. Right? So you think about those things. You think about, like, who connects with the jury the best. You know, who will look them in the eye and tell them the truth? Who does the jury think is the no-nonsense guy, right? Yep. And you, then you divide the work evenly among them, right? Who's, who's going to be best for what suitable job? So, Creighton, I'll, I'll say this much, and maybe I didn't – maybe I misread this, but I'm going to – I'm going back, and when I'm editing this, I'm, I, I'm, I, I swear I heard him pay a compliment to Creighton. Oh, I'm sure he did. Creighton's a great – look, I've, I've had cases with Creighton. Creighton's a great lawyer. Um, I believe him to be an honest guy, an ethical guy. And I, I think Creighton would say that about Dick and Jim. I, I don't know. Um, but Alan Wilson has committed to coming on the podcast. Alan is the yep. attorney general. Um, we'll see if we can get Creighton as well. Um, Creighton, being a uh, a government lawyer, may be a little more reluctant to get on. Right. 
But Allen's a elected official, so yeah. Allen will come on, right? And Allen sat through, I think, all of the trial, uh, sat at the table. And so Allen can give us the, the government's position and give us a rebuttal. Well, we were supposed to have Allen on a while back anyway. So, we, And Allen actually has stood beside us while we did a podcast. He just didn't get on when we did the Flounder podcast. That's right. Yeah, he was there. He, he was, was there. there. And he's been wanting to come on. We just hadn't had a chance really to get him on. But this is obviously the perfect opportunity for him to sort of give the rebuttal, I guess, is the, the right way to do that. We've, we've heard the defense's perspective, and I think it was, I mean, it was good. Yep. It was cohesive. It makes sense. He gave us, he articulated a theory on why he thought he didn't do it, and maybe somebody that did. And so uh, we'll hear what the prosecution has to say. Well, now. again, y'all answered a question that uh, the, the commoner like myself, who doesn't have a lot of, um, uh, you know, education in the legal process, in the fact that we clarified that he doesn't want them to walk in and say, oh, I did it, but let's, this is what I need help with. Oh, no, 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 no. You know? You would never. It, 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 it if, makes utter if, sense. Yeah, I mean, if, if I was defending somebody, and I don't do a whole lot of that work anymore, but if I was to take a case like that and somebody walked in and said, I did it, I'd say, go have a nice day, find somebody right. else. I mean, you, just, you cannot continue to perpetrate a lie on the court. Right, I mean, you can get disbarred for that. Other than the fact that it's just wrong. I mean, at the end of the day, if you if you know it, I mean, you don't have to take any case as a private defense lawyer. I mean, you don't have to take anything that sort of offends your offends your conscience. And if somebody walks in and says, "I did something horrible," and here it is, it might offend my conscience. You know, there may be some rationale for providing him a defense to make sure that he gets a fair trial. And but I don't have to be the guy to do that. Right. Right. I mean, I've, I've always felt like I needed to sort of believe in my client in order to, you know, in order to represent them the best they can. Now, Dick took a little different position. He said, I don't care. He yep. said, I mean, I think I don't want to speak what I'm for him, but I'll, I'll, it. paraphrasing, he, he says, I don't I don't care. My job is to make sure the state does their job. Right. My Amen. job is to make sure the state meets their burden. Yep. And I think there's honorable there, there's honor in that as well. Um, I, I personally, I, you know, I've, I've taken it one more step in defending people. I need to sort of believe in them, but I don't want them coming to me and telling me whether they did it or not in the beginning, right? I need to look at them. I need to hear their story. I need to look in their eye and believe them. And then I can go to the court and the jury and honestly convey that message. And, and, um, you know, and, and there's as much as the world wants to demean that there's honor in that. There really is. Cause a, a ev lot. Everybody in America that is an American citizen deserves that right. Everybody. Amen. Amen. That's the, Again, that's the wonderful part of the process. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you that the other case that this has been compared to, uh, obviously being the O.J. Simpson case, yeah. I, I'm going to say that from what I watched and from what I hear, I know there was some minor uh, errors made from, you know, in some – detective work and, and everything else. But for the most part, I mean, it seems like both sides, you know, the, the defense and prosecution, both sides had to work with, they had to do a hard job because there was not a lot of mistakes. And yeah, I mean, I know there is, is some discussion of some things, but this, it wasn't as blatant as the OJ case. This, I mean, to, come on. We, to me, you know, to me, this one is, is more baffling, a lot more baffling than O.J. I mean, after hearing the O.J. case, um, one could surmise, <laughs> one could surmise <laughs> that uh, the Rodney King fiasco in L.A. at the time, uh, or is it Oakland? Rodney King was L.A. or Oakland? LA. No, it was L.A., right? Yep. The Rodney King fiasco in L.A. created an environment where O.J. couldn't get convicted. That's right. Right? But – Almost everybody that watched that trial came out and said, that son of a bitch did it. He did it. He did it. And he got off. And the jury said no. In this case, I'd say there's a pretty close to 50-50. I mean, at least talking in the community, there's a pretty close 50-50 split on whether he did it or not. So there, it, There's a lot of questions on how he would have done it and why he would have done it. I mean, I got, I don't know, I'm sure you did too, two dozen texts from people. Me like, too. 
I don't think they met their burden. You know, people saying, I don't think they met their burden. Yep. There's a lot of confusion on why a lot of that stuff happened. There's a lot of confusion about why he lied. There's a lot of confusion about why he was at the dog kennels, you know, eight minutes or whatever, five minutes before the murders. There's a lot of confusion about why he didn't tell. Of course, Dick just explained to us why he would not have told the police immediately afterward. Right. Uh, it had been a violation of his Fifth Amendment rights. But there's still a lot of confusion, but nobody – Nobody has told me why he killed his son, at least not to my satisfaction, to cover up a financial crime. Sorry, I don't care. You can commit all the financial crimes in the world. It would never drive me to kill my child. That is a that It takes a real Amen. sick individual it does. to kill your own kid. So I'm going to say the OJ trial, you got an acquittal off of a glove, and I think in honest opinion – from an outsider looking in, obviously you had the financial stuff, but I think you got a guilty because of the dogs. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's just, in, in short, that's where I'm going with those two. The dog kennel video it was the nail in the coffin yep. for them. Right now, I mean, Dick, Dick took a little different perspective. He said, I think, if he, I think he would admit that as well, but he, he said the financial crimes coming in to evidence – created the environment where everybody said this guy's a liar and a, and a thief, right? But a liar especially. And once you um, indict somebody as a liar, you know, to convict somebody as a liar in your head, it's hard to turn around and say, yeah, they lied about that, but they didn't lie about this, right? Right. Oh, you, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Juror, I lied about all of those things, but, but I'm not lie lying to you about killing them. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're already starting off on the back foot. Yep. And, and – and so with the appeals process from yesterday, from listening to Dick's interview uh, after walking out the courtroom, um, it sounds like it's going to be at least six to eight months before they even get the transcript. Oh, yeah, it'll done. be a while, yeah. So, I mean, for everybody that's looking forward to next week starting to watch this, no, it's going to be a while. And then it'll be 18. And then it'll be pushed off further. Yeah, it'll, then, it's, it's you, like right now the Court of Appeals is 18 months backed up before you can get an oral argument once you get a transcript. So, I mean, it's going to be a while. And, yeah, maybe maybe the oral argument will be um, will be televised. I don't know. But but that that will be much less exciting than the than the uh, than the actual trial, right? Cuz there's no evidence coming in. Nope. Right? I mean, this is this is just a battle between two lawyers and the judges listening to it. And you know what went wrong legally in the courtroom, and and that won't create near the media excitement or frenzy that this did. That this, did. yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, it's been nice talking politics and legal stuff today. But tonight we're going to go hang out and celebrate some conservation at the CCA banquet. Yeah, yeah, looking forward so to that. So I'm going to head over there and go do some work and help those guys out. And uh, you know what? Next week we'll be back, and uh, you know we may have the other side of this whole situation before the next podcast but you've got a busy schedule coming up yeah um you're leaving to do some training and and i think we've decided that we're going to go down to florida and um hang out and do the rodeo and the fair with the kids remember it was all going on last year when we were there mm -hmm. i think we're going to go down there and maybe lucas and i are going to sneak out and chase a turkey one or two days but um oh, good. we're heading down there too so we'll try and uh, get some more stuff uh, here scheduled for the next week and get you a fresh podcast up uh talking hunting fishing and everything else but in the meantime remember if you want to check out all our brands and and everything that we've got you can go to trilogyoutdoorsmedia.com we've got the magazine that just came out yesterday it's on all the racks and uh, you can check it out right there on the website as well and don't forget southern English radio show every saturday morning on the gator 107.9 from 8 to 10, and, of course, the Grand Strand Fishing Rodeo, mm -hmm. which has really started gaining momentum. And uh, you can find it all right there on the website. So we're good. We good? I think we're good. I saw – We the, have a gavel that the, we can the, – the front, We should. The front page of the magazine this month looks great. Rick Austin did a fantastic story on turkey season, the beginning of turkey season. Mm -hmm. We're – First week of March right now, turkey season's in two weeks. Two three, weeks. Three weeks. Yep. Two, two and a half. Two yep. and a half weeks. So everybody I know is uh, heating up, starting to feel like springtime, and I'm looking forward to turkey season. Absolutely. Read, it's, time, it's time to get out there and do some of that. And read, that's right. Read Cur that article. 
Cover Boy Rick Austin. That's, a, that's his new nickname, Cover Boy, because he, he writes and he gets to cover. <laughs> All right, well, listen, we'll be back next week, and uh, we can't wait to talk pins, fur, and feathers here on Trilogy Outdoors. Trilogy Outdoors podcast is a product of Trilogy Outdoors Media. All views and opinions of our hosts and guests are not necessarily those of our sponsors. Trilogy Outdoors is produced and edited by Trilogy Outdoors Media. Be sure to follow us on all the podcast platforms as well as our social media pages on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And also, don't forget our other brands, Southern English Radio Show and Walk em All Outdoor Magazine. To find more information, visit TrilogyOutdoorsMedia.com. And remember, if it's anything dealing with fins, fur, and feathers, you're going to find it right here here on Trilogy Outdoors.